All praise to the Ancient of Days, all esteem to the Most High Elohim. This is your brother M. There was a book that was written several years ago called The 48 Laws of Power, and the author is Robert Greene. That book gained a lot of notoriety, especially amongst entrepreneurs, especially amongst so-called leaders in society. This discussion right here is in no way, shape or form to be in support of that book or be against that book. What I want to do is highlight how the adversary thinks and the adversary and crafty counsel that the enemy takes against the righteous. Even the Messiah talked about how the wicked in their generation are more shrewd than the righteous. And this book, The 48 Laws of Power, is one example of that, of the wicked attempting to be more shrewd than the righteous. And what I want to do today is talk about the 613 laws of power versus the 48 laws of power. I want to take a look at the laws and commands of the Most High. And for us to gain an understanding on how the laws and commands of the Most High give us power over the enemy, make us dominant over the enemy. And in talking about that, highlighting how the enemy thinks by examining this 48 laws of power. Let's go to the book of Psalm chapter 119, verse 98. And I got my daughter in the background here with me today. So if you hear her, that's my daughter. Now. Psalm 119, verse 98, it says, Thou through thy commandments has made me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever with me. Let's read this again, because King David is saying that the laws and commands of the Most High make him wiser than his enemies. And we know that King David was a mighty man of war. Not once was he ever defeated by his enemies. So here we have an undefeated king who ruled his empire with absolute dominance and every enemy that came up against him faced absolute slaughter. This is an undefeated king here telling us that through the commands of the Most High, he dominated his enemies. And when you look at the book, 48 Laws of Power, many leaders, many corporate executives, all the way to dudes that control blocks on the street level, Use some of those laws of power to dominate. But I'm going to show you how the 613 laws of the Most High give us power through the spirit of the Most High to dominate our enemies and to dominate our spiritual enemy even more so than the dominance that people like Napoleon had, the dominance that people like Alexander had, the dominance that people like Adolf had. A lot of these military war generals that are talked about in the book, 48 Laws of Power, how through the laws and commands of the Most High, we become, as the scripture says, more than conquerors. We become greater than a Julius Caesar. We become greater than an Emperor Caligula. We become greater than a Hannibal Barker through the laws and commands of the Most High. Hallelujah. Let's really get into this and examine this. Once again, Psalm 119 verse 98. Thou through thy commandments has made me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever with me. All praise. And when we talk about dominance, brothers and sisters, we're not talking about us going out here and uh, chopping heads off, things of that nature. What we're talking about is us having dominance in every area of our life and also having dominance over wicked, unclean spirits, demons. And if the situation calls for it, also having dominance over physical enemies that come against us as well. I'm talking about the full spectrum of dominance and the 613 laws of power, which are the, the fiery laws and the commands of the Most High are what give us that power. Hallelujah. And that power comes through the Most High. As David said, thou through thy commandments has made me wiser than my enemies. So I want to truly dive into the 613 laws of the Most High. We're not going to do this in one discussion, but I want to jump into a few of the laws and commands and compare and contrast it with the 48 laws of power. And I want us to be able to tap into that same dominance and victory that David tapped into by using the laws and commands of the Most High as his source of power. 
What was it that David was able to tap into that level of dominance through the laws and commands? And the Messiah's tapped into that as well, because the scripture says that he will rule all nations with an iron rod. That means dictatorial power. That means a righteous dictatorship. That means patriarchal dominance. The Messiah is going to rule undefeated over his enemies. And he's going to rule through those same laws of power that David was talking about. Those same commands that make us wiser than our enemies. Hallelujah. So let's get into this. The first of the 48 laws of power that's listed here is never outshine the master. Always make those above you feel comfortably superior. In your desire to please or impress them, do not go too far in displaying your talents or you might accomplish the opposite. Inspire fear and insecurity. Make your masters appear more brilliant than they are and you will attain the heights of power. Stop. Now that's one of the 48 laws of power. This is what he's teaching people on how to rise through the ranks. He's saying never outshine the master. Now, the way that he's explaining that is an impure version of what the laws and commands of the Most High tell us. What do the 613 laws of power of the commands of Torah tell us about never outshining the master? I'll give you one. I am the Most High, your Elohim. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. We must never allow any other God to outshine the Elohim of Israel. Never outshine the master. We are made in the Most High's image and in his likeness. We must never outshine the master. The most high is supreme. We can never outshine the master. So the first of the 613 laws of power, which in fact was the first law that the most high gave our people from Sinai. What did he say? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And what did he say right, right after that? Put some respect on my name. Do not take the name of the most high, your Elohim in vain. So what is he telling us? He's telling us that you will not outshine me. You are my people. You are my children. I will make you shine. The light that is within me, I have put within you. But he's telling us you will never outshine me. The most high will always be supreme. The most high will also be exactly what his name suggests. The most high. He's high above all principality and power. His name is never to be taken in vain. He is supreme. He is superior. And the Most High has given us his light, even though we can never outshine him. He has given us a light where we can shine above our enemies. And what does he say? Let's go to Genesis chapter 17, starting at verse one. It said, and when Abram was 90 years old and nine, the Most High appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the almighty Elohim. Walk before me and be thou perfect. And the Messiah tells us this as well. Because let's go to the scripture in Matthew chapter 5, verse 48. He says, be ye therefore perfect, even as your father, which is in heaven, is perfect. So we can never outshine our master, the most high, and we should never try. But what we always need to remember is that we are made in his image. So as he is, we must be. So it's not about us trying to outshine the most high. It's about us shining with the light of the most high and living out the same image that the most high is in. And what is the image of the most high kingdom, power, glory? The most high is patriarchal. He's a man of war. The most high is dominant. He has never lost a battle. The most high is all about law and principles. He even said that he's placed his word and his law above his name. Even his law and his principle is above his name. So this lets us know how the father is. So we must be the exact same way. We must be perfect even as our father in heaven is perfect. As he dominates, we must dominate. As he is victorious, we must be victorious. As he takes serious his principles and his laws, we also must take serious his principles and his laws. Hallelujah. We can never outshine the master, but we can shine with the light of our master. And the Messiah explains this as well. 
The Messiah would say it like this in Matthew chapter 10, verse 24. The disciple is not above his master, nor the servant above his Lord. We must remember this because it keeps us humble in this walk. But there's something else that the Messiah also said, which should keep us driven to fulfill that state of being perfect, even as the father is perfect. Listen to what the Messiah says here. Listen to what it says here in Luke chapter six, verse 40. It says the disciple is not above his master, but everyone that is perfect shall be as his master. So the scripture there is driving us towards that perfection where we will never be equal with the most high, but we can be like the Messiah in the regard of obeying our father's command and being dominant over the enemy as the Messiah is dominant over the enemy. Are you starting to see this? So we can never outshine the most high ever. And we shouldn't even try. But we can reach a place in this walk that the scripture calls be ye perfect, even as your father in heaven is perfect. And by doing that, you are shining with the light of your master instead of trying to outshine your master. Hallelujah. That's the true definition of putting no other gods before the most high. That's the true definition of not taking the most high's name in vain because we are living up to his image. And we become truly powerful and dominant when we do that, as it is written in the book of Zechariah. Let's pull that scripture in the book of Zechariah. Let's go to Zechariah chapter 12, verse 8. Listen to what it says about how powerful we become whenever we are truly full of zeal for the Father and putting no one before him and putting him before even ourselves. It says, in that day shall the Most High defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and he that is feeble among them at that day shall be as David, and the house of David shall be as the Most High, as the angel of the Most High before them. You really got to digest that scripture right there in Zechariah chapter 12, verse 8. It's saying that we will be so dominant and we are so dominant over the enemy that even the weakest brother in the pack will be like King David. The same King David that said, through the most high's laws, you have made me wiser than my enemies. The same King David that was dominant in warfare and he never caught no losses in his battles with the enemy. That same King David. The scripture there is saying that whenever we are perfect as the most high is perfect, and that is a state we must strive for whenever we do like the Messiah said and the disciple becomes like the master. We reach a place of power where even the weakest brother in the pack is like David. And the scripture says that the house of David shall be as the most high, as the angel of the most high before them. So that law of power from the 613 laws of power is way more powerful than what they're talking about in the first of the 48 laws of power. And I'm going to show you as we go through some of these, some more of these 48 laws of power, how many of these things are stuff that they just twisted around. They twisted around things that were already written in scripture. And granted, these laws of power have worked for many of the wicked. But I'm showing you how the 613 laws of power have worked for the righteous because David was undefeated in warfare. Nobody ever touched him in warfare. And he said he derived his strength from the 613 laws of power from the Most High Elohim. The scripture says he was a man after the Most High's own heart. So David, he was like that disciple that was trying to be in the image of his master. That's what it means to be after the Most High's own heart. David was striving for that place of perfection of what the Most High told Abraham, walk before me and be thou perfect. Be ye perfect even as your father in heaven is perfect. David was striving for that. He wasn't trying to outshine his master. Even with the Saul situation, he wasn't trying to outshine Saul. He was trying to be up to the image of what the Most High created him to be. And that was a king. That's the same for us as well. Now, 
Let's go to law number two of the 48 laws of power. I really truly hope you understand by the spirit what's being said here. What we're doing, we're edifying the 613 laws of power. And I'm showing you how that's more powerful than the laws of the wicked that they have used to dominate the world. And I'm showing you that these 613 laws of power is the laws that we will use to dominate the world again. Because what does the scripture say? In Isaiah chapter 49, verse 22, 23, it says, and kings shall be thy nursing fathers and their queens, thy nursing mothers. They shall bow down to thee with their face toward the earth and lick up the dust of thy feet. The scripture says that kings will bow down to us, the people of the most high. That's what you call righteous dominance. And we will achieve that righteous dominance through the most high, the 613 laws of power. Revelation 3 and 9. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved you. That's Hebrew supremacy. That's 613 laws of power right there. Hallelujah. That's the meek inherit in the earth right there. That's us ruling with the iron rod. As the Messiah said, as I have received power from my father and have become in the likeness of my father, I give you power. Also, as I sit on the throne and my enemies on my footstool, you sit on the throne and your enemies are your footstool. 613 laws of power. All praise. Now. Let's go to law number two of the 48 laws of power. We're not going to be able to do all this in one discussion. This is just part one. Here's what it says. Never put too much trust in friends. Learn how to use enemies. Be wary of friends. They will betray you more quickly for they are easily aroused to envy. They also become spoiled and tyrannical, but hire a former enemy and he will be more loyal than a friend because he has more to prove. In fact, you have more to fear from friends than from enemies. If you have no enemies, find a way to make them. Now, let's go to the 613 laws of power and let's see what Torah has to say about friends and enemies. Let's see what Torah has to say about where our allegiances should lie. Check this out. Deuteronomy chapter 13, verse 6. This is what we need to know about allegiances and associations with friends and enemies and the heart that we should have in this warfare. It says, if thy brother, the son of thy mother or thy son or thy daughter or the wife of thy bosom or thy friend, which is as thine own soul, entice thee secretly saying, let us go and serve other gods, which thou hast not known, thou nor thy fathers, namely of the gods of the people which are round about you, nigh unto thee or far off from thee, from the one end of the earth, even unto the other end of the earth, thou shalt not consent unto him, nor hearken unto him, neither shall thine eye pity him, neither shalt thou spare, neither shalt thou conceal him, but thou shalt surely kill him. Thine hand shall be first upon him to put him to death and afterward the hands of all the people. Mm. So the scripture there is saying that a friend can become an enemy if they turn against the laws and commands of the most high. So the scripture there is telling us a friend is only a friend as long as they are a friend to the most high. The minute they stop being a friend to the most high, and going against his laws and commands, trying to entice you to serve other gods and follow after false prophets, they become an enemy. So that's the 613 laws of power letting us know that the position of a friend or an enemy is only contingent upon how much that person is loyal to the most high. The minute, snap your fingers the minute. They become disloyal to the most high. They are no longer a friend. They are now an enemy. This is what the laws and commands is saying. This is real grown man and grown woman talk right here. The, this is why the 613 laws of power is so necessary for us to meditate on every day. Because this gives you more of a discipline in your soul, even more than the 48 laws of power can. This right here puts a discipline in your mind that the law and command of the most high is the line in the sand. And by people crossing that line in the sand, 
and disrespecting the Most High's name or his law or disrespecting his son, that's breaking fellowship right there. That's breaking the code right there. The laws and commands of the Most High is the code by which we live by. Are you seeing this? So we can never get to the point where we love people and love friends more than we love the law of the most high. Because the scripture just got done telling us here in Deuteronomy 13 that even if your friend who is as your own soul tries to entice you to follow after other gods or take the most high's name in vain or put other gods before the most high, they become an enemy. Hallelujah. Are you seeing this? Deuteronomy 13, those verses I just read are the exact reason why the Messiah made the statement that he did. Whenever he was sitting around teaching the people, they came to him and they said, Messiah, we have here your mother and your brothers and they want to see you. And the Messiah said, who is my mother? Who are my brothers? But those who do the will of the most high. Essentially, what the Messiah was doing was low key reminding the people about Deuteronomy 13 and letting them know, look, even if your mother, father, brother, Cousin, friend, if they turn against the most high, they are now an enemy. They are now against the most high. That don't mean we go around killing folks and all that. But what it is letting us know is where our allegiances should lie. And it's not with these manufactured titles of friend, mother, brother, all that. It's all contingent upon the most high. Everything is contingent upon the most high and his law. Our allegiances is to the most high first and foremost, not friends, not family, because friends and family can become enemies if they willfully transgress against the laws and commands of the most high. That's a law of power that we must follow that will cause us to have victory in this life because you can get defeated. If you get more wrapped up into loving friends and family over loving the most high. Now, I'm not putting no stuff out there telling folks to uh, be out here disrespecting and dishonoring their mother and father, especially those that still living underneath the roof of their mother and father. We can't be out here disrespecting them, but understand this. Your allegiances go to the most high first. That don't mean that you have to dishonor and disrespect these people who you have these connections to. It just means that your allegiance is to the most high first. All praise. Let's go to law number three of the 48 laws of power. Listen to what it says. It says, conceal your attentions. Keep people off balance and in the dark by never revealing the purpose behind your actions. If they have no clue what you are up to, they cannot prepare a defense. Guide them far enough down the wrong path, envelop them in enough smoke. And by the time they realize your intentions, it will be too late. You see this stuff, man? You see how the enemy thinks? This is why we have to go through this because we need to understand how the enemy takes crafty counsel. This book, The 48 Laws of Power, it is 101 on the crafty counsel of the wicked. This is how they think. Now, let's go over to the 613 Laws of Power and let's understand how the Most High tells us to deal with outsiders and enemies and not letting them get too close to the sacred thing. Let's check this out. Let's go to Exodus chapter 30, starting at verse 30. I'm going to show you some of the 613 laws of power that the scripture tells us to conceal certain things from outsiders. I'm showing you in these laws and commands how the Most High teaches by his laws that it is wise to conceal certain things from certain outsiders. Check this out. It says, and thou shalt anoint Aaron and his sons and consecrate them that they may minister unto me in the priest office. And thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel, saying, This shall be a holy anointing oil unto me throughout your generations. Upon man's flesh shall it not be poured. Neither shall ye make any other like it. After the composition of it, it is holy, and it shall be holy unto you. Listen to this, verse 33. Whosoever compoundeth any like it, or whosoever putteth any of it upon a stranger, shall even be cut off from his people. So that scripture is saying that this special anointing oil 
that was made for the priest and Aaron's sons, that whoever gave this anointing oil to an outsider, meaning a Gentile, a stranger, that person would be cut off from Israel. So there are some things that are only meant for your people. There are some things that are only meant for your tribe. So one of the laws of power of the Most High is he's telling us to protect the sacred things from outsiders. Some things are sacred and it's not meant for outsiders. So the Most High in his eternal infinite wisdom is letting us know that outsiders, whenever they see the the glory and the, the power that we have, they will envy it and want to take it for themselves. And we've seen that's what's happened throughout history because our people have not been keeping the 613 laws of power. We've been allowing outsiders in who are not authorized to even be in that inner circle. And the most high, one of the laws of power that he gave us is to keep outsiders away from the sacred thing. Think about the Ark of the Covenant. No Gentile could even touch the Ark of the Covenant or they would drop dead or disease and um, plague would spread throughout their city. Like when the ark was amongst the Philistines, they was dropping dead. They was getting herpes and hemorrhoids and the, the, the ark of the covenant was destroying their gods. The ark of the covenant was sacred and it was not meant for dirty Gentile hands to be touching all over it. And the most high gave us that in his 613 laws of power. There are certain things that are sacred that no Gentile should be touching. If we had that mentality about our women, we would not marry them off to no Gentile men. If we had that mentality about ourselves, we would not unite our bodies with whorish women. We have to protect what is sacred and keep that exclusive. We have to conceal what's sacred. Are you seeing this? Hallelujah. And I'm not saying that we have a unrighteous balance and that we be out here mistreating outsiders and oppressing them. No, because the laws and commands also say that we are not to vex the stranger. But there's a difference between vexing them and protecting what's sacred that they're not supposed to be privy to. It doesn't mean that you're mistreating somebody. By keeping them away from what the Most High told you is sacred for you and your people. That's not oppression. We're not excluding them from this walk. We're not excluding them from salvation. But what we are saying is that within this walk, there are certain things that they're still not privy to being an outsider, being a stranger. That's how we keep ourselves in power. By not allowing the outsiders with too much privy information. Because we've seen what happens whenever we share too much with them and bring them in too close. It will always arouse envy in their hearts. Just like when King Hezekiah was showing the Babylonians all his wealth and riches and they end up years later coming back to rob him. So whenever you're doing business with these Gentiles or in the workplace with these Gentiles, keep things on a need to know basis. Don't share too much with them. You need to conceal what's sacred. And that's how you maintain your power. Because if you share with them too much of information that they don't need to be privy to, they will use that to try to get the competitive edge over you. This is facts. So one of the 613 laws of power is we need to protect sacred information. We need to protect sacred things and keep the outsiders away from it. That's how we stay in power. Hallelujah. And that kind of uh, bleeds into this next number four of the 48 laws of power, which says always say less than necessary. When you are trying to impress people with words, the more you say, the more common you appear and the less in control. Even if you are saying something banal, it will seem original if you make it vague, open ended and sphinx like. Powerful people impress and intimidate by saying less. The more you say, the more likely you are to say something foolish. So this is why a lot of times 
Whenever you were around the, the, the heathen and the outsiders, they don't say much. And this is why a lot of ignorant Negroes, whenever they get, they get around them, they always feel the need to put on a show. They always want to be the one making everybody laugh. They always be, want to be the one cracking the jokes, doing all the talking, being the life of the party. But you notice whenever you be around a lot of Gentiles, they tend to ease back. They're sitting there observing you. They're sitting there trying to figure you out, see your angle. This is why a lot of them get quiet whenever our people come around. They'll say, okay, go, go, go ahead, monkey, put on a show for us. We don't need to be out here trying to put on no shows and be the life of the party for these Gentiles. Now, listen to what it says here. Law number five, 48 laws of power. It says so much depends on reputation guarded with your life. Reputation is the cornerstone of power through reputation alone. You can intimidate and win. Once you slip, however, you are vulnerable and will be attacked on all sides. Make your reputation unassailable. Always be alert to potential attacks and thwart them before they happen. Meanwhile, learn to destroy your enemies by opening holes in their own reputations. Then stand aside and let public opinion hang on them. Stop. Now, what's the 613 laws of power say about us as a people being a light to the Gentiles? Does not the scripture say that's supposed to be our reputation? Our reputation is supposed to be that we are the ones who received the laws and commands on Mount Sinai to give the laws to those who would cling to the most high and cling to his people. That's supposed to be the reputation that we are guarding at all cost. And that's what the scripture tells us to do as well. Listen to what it says here. Let's go through some of those 613 laws of power about us guarding our reputation as the people and kings and priests of the most high. Let's go to Exodus chapter 19, starting at verse five. Listen to what it says. Now, therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. So the scripture here is commanding us that we must have the highest reputation. Our reputation needs to be an 850 credit score. We're supposed to be the light to the Gentiles. So that's one of the 613 laws of power. Listen to what it says in verse six of Exodus 19. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. So we are supposed to be that peculiar treasure above all people, that nation and kingdom of priests. What does that speak to? That speaks to reputation. And even the most high speaks like this. Because when you look in the book of Malachi, the Most High himself says, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. My name shall be great among all nations. This is why our ancestors would always pray and say, Most High, please do this for your name's sake. For the Most High is very serious about his reputation. And he even told us as a people, whenever we disobey him and go off, he said that his name is blasphemed because of our wickedness. The most high is the master whom we are seeking to be in his image. So if he cares greatly about his reputation, we should also care greatly about ours. Now, that doesn't mean that we go about trying to be people pleasers because the Messiah also said that the servant will be treated like the master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub and a devil, then they will do much worse to you. But he also said, blessed are you who are persecuted for the kingdom and for righteousness sake. So if you following the laws and commands of the most high and being obedient to the father causes people to falsely put persecution on your reputation, it causes you to not be very well spoken of. If you doing right by the people of the most high and your family and your Elohim, if that causes you to be spoken of poorly in your community amongst your family, so be it. Because blessed are those who are persecuted for the kingdom's sake. But the scripture also says when a man's ways please the most high, he will even make his enemies to be at peace with him. And many times that's not because the enemies want to be at peace. It's because they are forced to be at peace. That your reputation is so above reproach 
that this person knows if they say anything ought against you or try to come against you, there's people that will rise up and say, hold on, that's a stand up dude right there. Why are you talking slick out your mouth about brother or sister so-and-so? Your reputation will be a high credit score and that will make enemies not want to come against you because they know that they will not have the majority behind them by coming against you. So the laws and commands here in Exodus 19, the laws of power are telling us that we must be that light. We must be that peculiar people in holy nation. That should be our reputation right there. Hallelujah. These are the 613 laws of power family. This is how we dominate in this life and in the life to come. Let's go to law number six of the 48 laws of power. It says court attention at all cost. Everything is judged by its appearance. What is unseen counts for nothing. Never let yourself get lost in the crowd then or buried in oblivion. Stand out. Be conspicuous at all cost. Make yourself a magnet of attention by appearing larger, more colorful, more mysterious than the bland and timid masses. Once again, that's how the enemy takes crafty counsel. This book right here is taking us into how the enemy thinks. Now, what we need to do is go into the 613 laws of power and let's see how the Most High commands us to stand out in righteousness, not to get attention, not to be an attention whore, not to try to manipulate or appear that we're something that we're not. But let's go to the laws and commands of how the Most High says that we must stand out in righteousness. Check this out. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 11 and 12. These are the things that the father has commanded us to do so that we stand out in righteousness. A, a law that is kept among our people exclusively that lets the world know that we are who we are. Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 11 and 12, it says, Thou shalt not wear a garment of diverse sorts as of woolen and linen together. Thou shalt make thee fringes upon the four quarters of thy vesture wherewith thou coverest thyself. So the scripture there is telling us that the father has commanded us to wear certain type of garments and to have those fringes because that makes us stand out that we belong to him and that we are of him, that we are that nation of priests and kings. Because let's also look at the laws and commands of Torah, the 613 laws of power about how the father wanted the priest to be a glorious example of the father's majesticness. Listen to this. Exodus chapter 28, starting at verse two, it says, and thou shalt make holy garments for Aaron, thy brother, for glory and for beauty. And thou shalt speak unto all that are wise hearted whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom that they may make Aaron's garments to consecrate him that he may minister unto me in the priest office. And these are the garments which they shall make a breastplate and an ephod and a robe and a broidered coat, a mitri and a girdle. And they shall make holy garments for Aaron, thy brother and his sons, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. And they shall take gold and blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen. And they shall make thee a fod of gold, of blue and a purple, of scarlet and fine twine linen with cunning work. And Exodus 28 goes through all the laws of the priestly garments. Hallelujah. So the father wants his people to righteously stand out, not for it to be no uh, fashion show or nothing like that. You know, not no Hebrew fast fashion show in Paris where everybody coming down the aisles, seeing who got the best fringes and whose, whose garments is the, is, is the, you know, the most holy and set apart. Not for that, because that's why the Messiah rebuked the Pharisees and them because he talked about they make broad their phylacteries. I'm not talking about us being overly flamboyant and trying to get attention because that would be after the mentality of those who take crafty counsel against us. You see how wicked their fashion industry is with men dressing like women and women dressing like men. Now we've got to the point where the law and command of Torah that's in Deuteronomy 22, 5, it says the woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man. Neither shall a man put on a woman's garment for all that do so are abomination unto the most high thy Elohim. That law right there in this society now is revolutionary. 
That's revolutionary because we live in a time where men are wearing women clothing and it's considered high fashion. Women are wearing men's clothing and it's considered high fashion. But the scripture has commanded us in the 613 laws of power in order for us to have power and dominance. The way that we present ourselves must be such where it is not of the enemies. It's almost like whenever you see a sports game, you know who is on what team by the apparel that they have on the uniform. So we need to make sure that we have the uniform of a set apart Hebrew and a set apart Israelite, not for attention, not to be a Pharisee, but to truly make sure that first our heart is pure and that our outward man reflects what is already within our inward man. Hallelujah. Because the scripture does talk about that the most high will judge all of those who are of strange apparel, strange apparel, meaning the apparel of the Gentiles that praises their false gods. Many of the clothing designs these days have the names of false gods all over it. Many of the biggest billion dollar companies that produce clothing have the names of false gods written all over the clothing or it has satanic symbolism on it. So a first step for us to purge our wardrobe is to get rid of some of those clothes that bear the inscription of false gods to get rid of some of those things that go against the laws and commands of the most high of how it says that a king and a priest should be appareled. I'm not saying that we got to be walking around out here in uh, full length robes with, you know, I am an Israelite, you know, etched all over it and all that spending $500 on one garment. That's not what we're saying. We're not trying to make nobody feel bad about getting some socks from Walmart or a, a shirt from Walmart and all that. As long as it's up to the laws and commands of not being a mixed fabric and all that. So we don't want to put too much emphasis on, on that. The inward man first, then the outward man, inner before outer. But what we are saying is that since the most high put that in his laws and commands, and we know that the wicked also use this same aspect for them to get power. Whenever you look at how the wicked present themselves, a lot of these businessmen in the three piece suits, like they will go out there looking sharp and that makes them stand out. They'll go out there looking sharp and have a presentation and the way they present themselves will make people more likely to listen to what they have to say. That's just a law of human nature. People don't judge righteous judgment. They judge by outer appearance. But the most high looks on the heart. Even though the most high looks on the heart, he also does have laws and commands also about our outward appearance that we need to keep. If we truly want to be that powerful people obeying the 613 laws of power, because all these wicked have come into dominance by keeping the 48 laws of power. How much more powerful are we as we keep the most high's 613 laws of power. Hallelujah. Now, let's go to uh, law number seven of the 48 laws of power. It says, get others to do the work for you, but always take the credit. Use the wisdom, knowledge, and legwork of other people to further your own cause. Not only will such assistance save you valuable time and energy, it will give you a godlike aura of efficiency and speed. In the end, your helpers will be forgotten and you will be remembered. Never do yourself what others can do for you. Now, we definitely know that the adversary has been keeping that law of power because they've always used our people as their legwork and their flunkies. They've always used our people to build their empires and build their civilizations. And then they took all the credit for it. All the hard work we put in physical and mental then they take all the credit for it and say it was them. So they have definitely kept this law of the 48 laws of power to have other people do the work for you, but then you take the credit for it. But let's go to the 613 laws of power because guess what? The most high has given us laws about our servants and our slaves because here's the thing. The people of the most high in our kingdom, the nations will be our servants and our slaves. Hallelujah. Let's get some of those scriptures about that. Because all the crafty counsel that they've taken will turn right back around on them. 
as they used other people for slave labor and all that and took all the credit, they will be used for slave labor to build up our walls and prune our vineyards. Let's go to these scriptures. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 14, starting at verse one. It says, for the most high will have mercy on Jacob and will yet choose Israel and set them in their own land. And the strangers shall be joined with them and they shall cleave to the house of Jacob and the people shall take them and bring them to their place. Listen to this. And the house of Israel shall possess them in the land of the most high for servants and handmaids. And they shall take them captives whose captives they were and they shall rule over their oppressors. So the scripture there is letting us know that the Gentiles and the strangers are supposed to be our servants and our slaves. We are dominant over them. They are not dominant over us. They are our servants and slaves. We are not their servants and slaves. So the scripture is commanding us to lord over them. Hallelujah. Isaiah chapter 60 verse 10 and the sons of strangers shall build up thy walls and their kings shall minister unto thee. For in my wrath I smote thee, but in my favor have I had mercy on thee. Verse 12, for the nation and kingdom that will not serve thee shall perish. Those nations shall be utterly wasted. So the scripture there is telling us that the Gentiles are meant to be our servants and slaves to build up our walls, to prune our vineyards, to mow our grass. And guess what? We don't even got to wait until the kingdom to have Gentiles working for us. If you have an entrepreneur mindset, you can have Gentiles working for you right now. Don't you know there's brothers and sisters who are Hebrew right now that have heathens and Gentiles and Europeans cleaning their toilets, mopping their floors, being a butler in their home? You don't even got to wait until the kingdom to have the Gentiles serving you. If you have an entrepreneur go-getter mindset, they can be serving you right now. Hallelujah. How's that for inspiration? Let's go to some more of these laws and commands of Torah about how the Gentiles are meant to be our servants. Let's go to Leviticus chapter 25, starting at verse 44, and let's see what the 613 laws of power have to tell us about how our enemies are supposed to be our slaves. Hallelujah. So these white folks, these Arabs, all these different nationalities and ethnicities, these Indians, they are our slaves and servants. We are dominant. They are subservient. This is facts. This is the 613 laws of power. So everything we do in this life needs to show forth that dominance of them serving us and us not serving them. Leviticus 25, 44, it says, both thy bondmen and thy bondmaids, which thou shalt have, shall be of the heathen that are round about you. Of them shall ye buy bondmen and bondmaids. Moreover, of the children of the strangers that do sojourn among you, of them shall ye buy, and of their families that are with you, which they begat in your land, and they shall be your possession. And ye shall take them as an inheritance for your children after you, to inherit them for a possession. They shall be your bondmen forever. But over your brethren, the children of Israel, ye shall not rule one over another with rigor. So the scripture there is telling us that the Gentiles and the nations are meant to be our possession. They're meant to be our servants and slaves. This is all scripture right here. This is the 613 laws of power. There's no such thing as equality. There's no equality in nature. Lions don't bow to hyenas. Eagles don't bow to cockroaches and kings don't bow to pre peasants. Hallelujah. So we are meant to be that dominant people. They are meant to be that subservient people. And the laws and commands is telling us that. But even at that, with them being our servants and slaves, we're not going to deal with them in wickedness like they dealt with us. They did not deal with us whenever the father gave us into their hand for a period of time. They did not deal with us after the laws and commands of how a servant is supposed to be dealt with. Because. Let's go to the laws and commands in Exodus chapter 21, starting at verse 20. And it tells how we are supposed to even deal with our slaves and servants in righteousness. It says, and if a man smite his servant or is made with a rod and he die under his hand, he shall surely be punished. Notwithstanding, if he continue a day or two, he shall not be punished for he is his own money. Verse 26 
And if a man smite the eye of his servant or the eye of his maid that it perish, he shall let him go free for his eye's sake. And if he smite out his manservant's tooth or his maidservant's tooth, he shall let him go free for his tooth's sake. So the laws and commands of the Most High, the 613 laws of power, is so righteous that the Father commands us how to treat our servants and slaves. That if they disobey and we have to beat them down, that if we knock one of their eyes out or knock a tooth out, we have to let them go free because now they lose an eye and a tooth. The Gentiles didn't deal with us that way. They was castrating our men. They was ripping babies out of the stomach of pregnant women. They was raping, buck breaking and raping our men in front of the whole village and in front of the whole plantation. It wasn't nothing written in the laws of the most high about doing none of that wickedness. They took it five steps further than it was supposed to get taken. And that's why their judgment will be meted and given back to them 10 times from what they gave. Hallelujah. That's why what's written is what's written in the book of Joel. Let's go there real quick. Because right there, it talks about how these nations will be dealt with as servants. Listen to what it says here. Joel chapter three, starting at verse five. Listen to what the most high tells the Gentiles, because ye have taken my silver and my gold and have carried into your temples, my goodly, pleasant things. The children also of Judah and the children of Jerusalem have ye sold unto the Grecians that me might remove them far from their border. Behold, I will raise them out of the place where the ye have sold them and will return your recompense upon your own head. And I will sell your sons and your daughters into the hand of the children of Judah, and they shall sell them to the Sabians, to a people far off. So the scripture there prophesies that these nations will be sold into slavery. They are meant to be servants. They are meant to be slaves. You see? All praise to the Most High. This, brothers and sisters, this is a new mindset. This is the 613 laws of power. Now, let's go back to uh, the 48 laws of power, law number eight. It says, make other people come to you. Use bait if necessary. When you force the other person to act, you are the one in control. It is always better to make your opponent come to you, abandoning his own plans in the process. Lure him with fabulous gains, then attack. You hold the cards. Now, let's go to the 613 laws of power and... Let's see how the Most High commands us to deal with enemies in warfare. Check this out. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 20, starting at verse 1. It says, When thou goest out to battle against thine enemies and seest horses and chariots and a people more than thou, be not afraid of them. For the Most High thy Elohim is with thee, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And it shall be when ye are come nigh unto the battle, that the priest shall approach and speak unto the people, and shall say unto them, Hear, O Israel, ye approach this day unto battle against your enemies. Let not your hearts faint, fear not, and do not tremble, neither be ye terrified because of them. For the Most High your Elohim is he that goeth with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you. And the officer shall speak unto the people, saying, What man is there that have built a new house and have not dedicated it. Let him go and return to his house, lest he die in the battle and another man dedicate it. And what man is he that have planted a vineyard and have not yet eaten of it? Let him also go and return unto his house, lest he die in the battle and another man eat of it. And what man is there that have betrothed a wife and have not taken her? Let him go and return unto his house, lest he die in the battle and another man take her. And the officer shall speak further unto the people and they shall say, what man is there that is fearful and faint hearted? Let him go and return unto his house, lest his brethren's heart faint as well as his heart. So the law of warfare, according to the 613 laws of power, is that no man is able to war if his heart is with his material possessions and if his heart is with the woman that he loves or if he's afraid. So the scripture there is telling us in order for us to be effective warriors of the most high, we must not love our material possessions more than we love the most high. That don't mean that we can't amass material wealth because the, the law and commands of Torah also say it's the power of the most high that gives us power to get wealth. So it's not saying that we can't amass wealth and possessions. It's not saying that we can't marry and have a wife. It's not saying any of that. It's not saying that we can't purchase land, 
But what it's saying here, if you love that stuff more than you love the most high, and if you are attached to that, where you are even willing to go out and fight against the most high's enemies, then you're not worthy to be on the battlefield. As the Messiah said, any man who puts his hand to the sickle and looks back is not worthy of me. What he's talking about is Deuteronomy chapter 20. In order for us to be efficient warriors, the issues of this life can't choke out our fruit and blind us. That's what this scripture is saying right here. Hallelujah. Now let's go forward and see what the laws and commands have to say about warfare. It says, and it shall be when the officers have made an end of speaking unto the people that they shall make captains of the armies to lead the people. And when thou comest unto a city to fight against it, then proclaim peace unto it. And it shall be if it make thee an answer of peace and open unto thee, then it shall be that all the people that is found therein shall be tributaries unto thee and they shall serve thee. So the scripture there is saying that we were a people that are commanded to seek peace first. Are you seeing this? This is powerful. So in all of our dealings, as the scripture says, we must seek peace with all men. So we must seek peace first to come into an understanding. We must not be out here like no war savages and colonizers like the Europeans and the wicked are. But we must be a people that seek peace first. And that's dealing with anybody like, let me see what I can do to get up to be on good terms with this person first. And then if they show themselves to be those type of people, like King David said, that whenever you speak for peace, they still want war. Then guess what? If they want war, then we got to bring it to them. Because listen to what the law of war here says in verse 12 about whenever people reject our terms of peace, what we do, it says, and if it will make no peace with thee, but will make war against thee, then thou shalt besiege it. And when the Most High thy Elohim have delivered it into thine hands, thou shalt smite every male thereof with the edge of the sword. So if they don't accept terms of peace, okay, that means we enemies, and that means I'm on your helmet. I'm on your head. Hallelujah. That means it's warfare, spiritual, physical, whatever level you want to get on, we can do it because I came to you with peace. You rejected it and you want war. Okay, so now I'm going to give that to you. That's what you call 613 laws of power right there. Notice that the scripture doesn't say nothing about whenever they reject your terms of peace, that you still keep going, trying to bow down to them and be friends with them. No, they've shown themselves to be an enemy. Okay, let's get it popping then if you want to be an enemy. You see that? See, th this is the mind state that we have to have to overcome those who have taken crafty counsel against us. And you notice there in uh, verse 11, where it says that if they accept those terms of peace, then they must be tributaries, meaning that they must be servants, meaning that it still must be understood that you're the dominant one here. You're the dominant one in this relationship. Whenever you're dealing with them in all your negotiations and all your contracts, it must be known you're the dominant one. You know how uh, Floyd Mayweather be talking whenever he have a fight. He like he's like I'm the A side. Like I'm I'm the I'm the showstopper of this situation. I'm the dominant one. So whenever we do business with these folks, whenever we have contracts of business with these folks, we always have to be the alpha in the room. We almost we always must be the one in the room to where the things that we're putting forth are the dominant. We must be the majority shareholder in all situations. As the scripture would say in the laws and commands, you are above only and never beneath. You are the head and not the tail. We ain't, we must not be out here taking the crap end and no deals or, you know, eating the crumbs that falls from the Gentiles table. No, we are the high table. We are the high council. We are the uh, kings and priests. They are on our terms. We're not on their terms. That's the mentality that we have to have. And that's how we got to move all praise. But I'm going to stop right there because I don't want to uh, keep going on. I could go on and on with this discussion, but we're going to break it up into different parts of taking a look at the 613 laws of power and then taking a look at the 48 laws of power and showing you that it's through the laws and commands of the most high that we truly become dominant. Hallelujah. And once again, I'm going to end with Psalm 119, verse 98, 
Thou, through thy commandments, has made me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever with me. Hallelujah. Before I go, I just want to make brothers and sisters aware of some of the projects of the ministry that we have released. We have released a great project called the 613 Laws of Torah audiobook. This is a five hour long audiobook narrated by myself, and it contains all 613 laws of Torah. There's no other commentary in the audio book, just the laws and commands in the audio book. I also quote the chapter and verse where those laws are found so that you can follow along with the text as you listen to the audio book. In the audio book, we narrate from the King James Version, and I don't use any pagan names like God or Lord. We only use the set apart sacred names. Hallelujah. Five hours of only the laws and commands. We put that audio book together because of what's written in Joshua chapter one, verse six through eight. Let me pull that up real quick. Listen to what it says here. Be strong and of a good courage. For unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swore unto their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. And Joshua was another war general and man of war, that he dominated his enemies through the 613 laws of power. So we put together an audio book where you can meditate on all those laws every day. And it will make you powerful like David and Joshua by meditating on the laws and commands, by internalizing those laws and commands. Just like these heathens worship the 48 laws of power, we must internalize the 613 laws of power so we can be more than conquerors and dominate those who have taken crafty counsel against us. The audio book is in a form where you can download it to your tablet, your uh, phone, your computer. You can listen to the laws and commands while you on the go, while you in the car driving to work, while you at work, while you working out in the gym, while you cooking in the kitchen, while you going to sleep at night, while you studying. You can have the laws and commands playing in the background. That's why we have put it in audio book form, because the scripture says that faith comes by hearing. So by hearing the laws and commands, you internalize it. All praise by listening to it with repetition over and over. You digest it. Hallelujah. So I'm going to put a link in the description box underneath this video that will prompt you on how to download that audio book and invest in that project. It's a five hour long audio book with only the 613 laws and commands of Torah. Check that out. Check out the link in the description box under this video. Another project that we have released is the words of the Messiah audio book. This is a four hour long audio book also narrated by myself. It contains the parables and wise sayings of the Messiah taken from the books of Matthew all the way to John. It's also narrated from the King James Version with no pagan names used. We put together that audio book because the Messiah is the Torah in the flesh. So by meditating on his words, we learn more how to worship the Most High in spirit and in truth and how to walk in the footsteps of the Messiah because he also is a mighty man of war. He's going to be standing chest deep in the blood of his enemies. He's a mighty warrior. Hallelujah. So by meditating on his words, it's like we're receiving commands from our commanding officer, from the Messiah. So by meditating on his words, that's another source of power for us. It's a four hour long audio book. I'll also put the link in the description box underneath this video on how you can invest in the words of the Messiah audio book. Another project that we have done is the words of the father audio book. This is a 14 hour long audio book, also narrated by myself. This book contains all the words that came out of the father's mouth recorded in scripture, all the way from Genesis, where he says, let there be light all the way to the New Testament, where he says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. We put together that audio book because the scripture says man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the father. So we've literally put together a 14 hour long audio book with only the words of the father spoken through his own mouth and through the inspiration of the prophets. I will also put a link in the description box under this video 
on how you can download that audio book and invest in that project. We are also doing the Hebrews for Excellence and Exodus campaign. This is something that we started in January. The goal of it is to fulfill what the scriptures tell us about how the truth must be spread to all four corners of the earth. So we are literally traveling from city to city all over the United States and all over the world to preach, teach, baptize. We've already been to San Diego. We've been to Jamestown, Virginia. We're going to be going to New York City here next. And whenever we go to these cities, we will be baptizing. We will be preaching and teaching. We will be having meetings with brothers and sisters to talk about homeschooling, home fellowship, launching home businesses. We will be visiting the hospitals, nursing homes, orphanages, jails, prisons to minister to our people, to do the work of the Messiah and the disciples, to go about doing the work. Hallelujah. And this campaign is also into acquiring land here coming up in January. We will be acquiring land in Georgia and in Arkansas, and that land will be used for Hebrew farms. That land will be used for set apart Torah based communities so that we can truly be self-sufficient and self-sustained. Great things are coming with the Hebrews for Excellence and Exodus movement. For those who are interested in taking part with that and joining with us on some of these ministry trips, you can find my email in the description box underneath this video. For those who are interested in donating to the Hebrews for Excellence and Exodus Fund, you will also find a link in the description box underneath this video on how you can donate to the movement. Other than that, I thank you, brothers and sisters, for taking the time to listen. Most how will we will be back tomorrow going through some more scriptures that will give us strength to endure and endure to the end with victory, success and destiny. Shalom.